Hey everyone. Hello. Welcome back. Um, we're we're gonna talk about more space today. So, all right. You gotta take. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna wear mine the entire time. <laughs> okay. Diego is gonna wear his the entire. Nope. Nope. No, he's not. It's really hard to see in those things, but that's okay. Welcome back. I'm James. I'm Diego. We're gonna talk about space some more today because. We had way more stuff to talk about yesterday than we had time to talk about. So we're going to play catch up a little bit. And then we're going to be talking about the universe. Yesterday was mostly about our own solar system. We're going to expand our view a bit more today. Uh, first, before we begin, we want to just give a quick hello and shout out to Jessica Meir, this is a picture of Jessica Meir. She is in space right now, and she is returning back to Earth tonight after several months on the International Space Station. Uh, you about, want to... about 6.50 uh, Pacific time. Yeah. Yeah, she'll be landing on Earth. She's been in, I, she, do you know how long she's been up there? Several months. Several months, yeah. Yeah. And uh, a, a few months ago, Jessica and her colleague, Christina Koch, were part of the first all woman spacewalk in human history. The two of them went out there and they were doing really important maintenance on the International Space Station. And Diego and I were watching bits of that live and it was really cool to see two humans up there in space. It, here, here they are getting suited up and ready for their spacewalk. And here they are out in space, <laughs> yeah. 250 miles above planet Earth, traveling at 17,500 miles per hour and just going to work. One of the things too, when you, when you do a spacewalk, you have to have really strong grip strength because the inflated glove um, will just resist your hand all the time. So, you're, so you'll see astronauts before they're um, the months before they're getting ready to do their spacewalk, they're um, squeezing different things. They have different exercise equipment going on. So they're strengthening their wrists and you'll see their wrists are just strong. They have, they have a superhuman strength <laughs> they have to be able to put things together. And it, it's hard to work with those gloves on. I'm going to call it space strength. Space strength. Yeah. Ah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, looks like a bunch of you have found the Q&A box already. Uh, hello to Oliver and Katya and Kanan and Julie. If I miss any of you, I apologize. We get thousands of, of entries into the Q&A box and I try to get to as many of them as I can within the time. Hello, hello Ethan. To Ethan and Anjali and Leah and Cyan. And Akanksha says she loves the hats. Thank you, we love them too. It's <laughs> yeah. just really hard to see. And I don't know if you can hear me very well. Noah and Hartley and a bunch of other people. Hello, hello, and welcome. All right. I know there's people here from New Jersey where we came by that New Jersey school yeah. a few months ago and we made space helmets like this. It was a ton of fun. Yeah, and we, we didn't get even a chance to talk about Jessica Muir. Pull that picture up again real quick. Yeah. Jessica Muir, her sister Becca um, taught at Delphi Boston which I think is really cool. We yeah. have a lot of uh, connections at the Delphi network through various people at JPL. We have, um, you know, just, just a lot of people doing really cool stuff. And, yeah. and JPL is a part of NASA that helps design super cool robots and spaceships and things to go out and explore. It's awesome. Okay, <laughs> yesterday. We were, I'm, I'm breathless already. Yeah, we could talk all ah, day about yeah. space. Yeah, I'm working on my space strength. <laughs> Yesterday, we were talking about dwarf planets at the very end. And I had to end the broadcast right on time because we were going to have a fire drill yesterday. Right as we were ending, I didn't want to get interrupted <laughs> and leave you all sitting here like, where did they go? Uh, so Pluto, as we discussed yesterday, is it still exists. We just call it a dwarf planet now instead of a full planet. Because as you can see from this picture here, it's smaller than our moon. And there are several other objects in the solar system that are about the same size as it and that are smaller than our moon and that don't really fit the definition of planet as we understand it anymore. 
other dwarf planets in our solar system are Eris and Haumea and Makemake, all of which are out in the outer rim of our solar system, out past Neptune. One very astute viewer yesterday mentioned to me that I had said that Ceres was th this dwarf planet over here to the right, that Ceres was in the Kuiper Belt, or in the, the um, Kuiper Belt out past Neptune. It's not, it's in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Oh, wow. Thank you to that viewer. I didn't know that. I knew that, but I misspoke. Uh huh. And I am always happy to be corrected. I don't mind yeah, being corrected, yeah. especially when I'm wrong. Yeah, it, that's really cool. Yeah. We had a student who brought that in. That's awesome. Good yeah. job and keep studying space. Right. So, as we discussed yesterday, there's only eight planets in our solar system F for now. Maybe not, because Here's the awesome thing about science, Diego, we're never done. We're never done learning. Uh, Stephen Hawking is one of the most famous scientists, one of the most famous astrophysicists, guy who studies space and physics and space ever. He was the one that figured out a bunch of stuff about black holes and he won a bunch of awards for it. As soon as he was able to prove the math about black holes, he dedicated the rest of his life to proving himself wrong because he knew he could do better. He knew he could learn more. He knew that there were holes in what he had figured out. He wanted to fill those holes, those black holes, if you will. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we are aware of eight full planets in our solar system, but it appears there might be a ninth planet out there. And this is a very exciting time for astronomy and for studying space. They're hunting for planet nine right now. Yeah, and they might not know this at home, but Neptune was the first planet that was discovered by, or discovered with just using mathematics. So people were looking at the, uh, looking at the math behind it and they found out there's, there has to be something here. Yeah. You know, it reminds me of that part in Star Wars where um, uh, you might know the line specifically. <laughs> Do you know this line? <laughs> Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about this line. Well, so Obi-Wan in Star Wars, for those of you who haven't seen it, there's this guy, he's looking for a planet that he thinks is supposed to be there. It's not on any of the charts. It's not on any of the maps. He goes to talk to Yoda. He's like, Yoda, I don't get it. What, like, it should be there, but I don't see it on any of the maps. And everything, all the other objects... I'm going to pop out a screen share. Oh, yeah. I wasn't going to bring up this line. And <laughs> well, this is perfect for you. You tricked me into we're it. We're talking about the, the ninth planet. Like, uh oh, James is talking about Star Wars again. <laughs> like, there was all this stuff in space all gently being pulled, very, very gently being pulled towards this one spot, which means that there was a pull of gravity from that spot, but there was nothing there. And Yoda asks some young children, what do you think? And the kids are like, listen, if everything's saying it's supposed to be there, it's there, whether it's on the map or not. And that's how Neptune was discovered. Yeah, so it's like, go look at where it should be and you'll find it. Yeah. So, great piece of sci-fi. <laughs> Science fiction kind of tends to lead the way on some of yeah. these things. Go to the center of gravity's pull and find your missing planet, you will. <laughs> okay. Uh, someone uh, really up here. Uh, uh, my dad says it's science, but I think it's more about space, this class. Amelia, yes and yes, it's both. Uh, we are studying about the science of space and yeah. science in space and science about space. And science is just the study of the world. Yeah. I love it. And space around the world. Okay, good. Okay. Um, going back to the hunt for planet nine. So here's what these guys what these astronomers were seeing that kind of got them um, thinking more about this. You see these big um, oval signs here in, in green and in purple and some in gray. These are all orbits of objects from our Kuiper Belt, objects outside of Neptune's orbit that <clears throat> were really interesting to these guys because it should be that these objects were just very happily floating out in their orbit out beyond Neptune in the Kuiper Belt. And something had kind of started pushing or pulling them in towards the solar system and putting them on these, on these long 
orbits like bring them really close to the sun and then really far away and then really close and then really far away. Why didn't they just stay out there? Why are they coming in? So after looking at enough pieces of data, these guys figured out there had to be something, you know, these things were just kind of floating along on their orbit happily. La di da di da. They're just kind of going along just happily out there. And then here comes this something, something massive, something with gravity and redirects them inward like this. And that's how you get these like, there's the sun there. That sends them on those long, long orbits. So they did a bunch of math because that's part of the job. And they figured out, do you know what would perfectly explain this? What's up? If there was a ninth planet out there, and if it was roughly five times as massive as the Earth, if you put five Earths together and put them out on what they figured out this orbit would probably was, and that's the yellow orbit right there, they're thinking that would perfectly explain this. Um, here is a picture, a drawing of what they think it might look like, about how big they think it might be. You know, maybe a little bit smaller than Uranus or Neptune. I mean, it's a big thing out there. It's huge, way bigger than the Earth, but guess what? It's really dark out there. If we were to turn out the sun, <laughs> we couldn't see. And this thing is way out there. If you go from the Earth, uh, if you go from the sun to Neptune, and then you do that 10 more times. That's about where they think this thing is. Oh, wow. It's I way I didn't realize up. the scale of that, wow. Yeah. Very cool. Um, okay, okay. I really wanted to talk about Planet Nine. Um, all right, yeah. I'm gonna answer- More science coming up. Who mm. knows, maybe one of our listeners will discover Planet Nine. Yeah. <laughs> Joe says, cool. Joe, you're right. <laughs> uh, I think it's probably Jackson there. Jackson, you're totally right, it is cool. Hadia says, hello from Pakistan. Alette says, is that from Star Wars? Yep, that quote was from Star Wars. Uh, Oliver asks, what is an orbit? Uh, yes, so I'll go over some stuff that we went over yesterday. For those of you who weren't able to join us yesterday, an orbit, let me use red, there's a sun. Here's a planet, we're gonna call it Earth. Earth moves around the sun. Well, let's say it moves that way. <laughs> the Earth moves around the sun in a regular circle. That's called an orbit. Uh, or this could be the Earth and this could be our moon moving around our planet in a regular circle, a regular path. That's called an orbit. It could be circle. It could be an oval. It could yeah. be more like... One simple demo is to grab a ball at home, take a piece of string, swing it around and you have you'll you'll have an orbit and so that would that would give you a perfectly circular orbit um but the fascinating thing is when you get these um kind of off of these they call them elliptical which are these oval type shapes um these elliptical orbits because then you can try to guess uh what, what what's tugging on those planets or what's tugging on that piece of mass and that's what yeah I'm about. good um, let's see, Ethan was asking about black holes. Ethan, we're gonna talk about black holes in a little bit. <laughs> this planet nine is not a black hole. It's just a planet out there that's, it's, it's not black, it's not a black hole. It's just hard to see because there's no light on it. If you wake up in the middle of the night and all the lights are off and your room is totally dark and you're stumbling around your room trying to find a planet, it's hard to see, <laughs> so. <laughs> I don't know about you. It's really, but far, it's really far away. I mean, it's really that, far away, yeah. What I was, was that distance again? You go to Neptune? You go from the sun to Neptune, <clears throat> and then you do that 10 more times. And so it's probably further, out farther than that. Much further than Pluto. Way Pluto, out Pluto, you gotta think, we just got the first images of Pluto because we did a, a flyby yep. with New Horizons. Yep. So. All right, Alette says, it sounds like hard math. It's extremely hard math. Isn't that cool? Yeah, <laughs> and these guys figured it out, or at least they figured out the math that could explain what's there. Now they're looking, and it might not be there. It might be something completely different 
there might be another explanation. That's the great thing about science. You get to look and either be like, yep, that's what we thought, or that's totally different. We're going to talk a little bit later about examples when things were totally different from what were expected and how awesome that was. Okay. Catching up on everything that you guys are saying. Cleo says, wouldn't it be way too cold for any human to withstand? Yep. Yeah. Way very, too cold. Very cold out there. Yep. All right. Um, let's see. Lily asks, how is Mars so hot, but Mars is the fourth planet? Uh, Mars could look hot because it's red. It's actually quite cold. The highest recorded temperature that they have on Mars is equal to maybe a, like a medium spring day in Antarctica. <laughs> um, like it can get close to, or maybe just above freezing on like the hottest of summer days on Mars. The average temperature on Mars is well below zero. It makes Antarctica look like Florida. Yeah, cold place. <laughs> yeah, Amelia says people are trying to make it so we can live on Mars. Yeah, it's really tough, it's really difficult. It's a big challenge. There's millions of problems that we need to solve before that'll work. And people are working on that because humans love problems. We love solving things. And listen, we have had humans living in space nonstop for the past like 20 years. That's incredible. At no point in the last, like at least two decades, has there not been a human in space. That, that's mind boggling to me. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. We are living in the future. Uh, we don't have flying cars. We don't have, you know, a lot of the stuff that science fiction might have predicted, but we got some of it. Yep. And science fiction didn't always predict this, didn't always predict cell phones. So yeah, that's okay. A lot of things coming up. <laughs> good, 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 good. We are, whoo. All right, someone asked, how many AU? Okay, so going back really quick, let me pull this up. We talked yesterday about a unit of measurement called an AU or an astronomical unit. And an astronomical unit is the distance from the sun to the earth, about 93 million miles. So if you were to measure from the sun to the earth, that is one AU, and that's a useful unit of measurement. Uh, we see the scale on this slide here. From those two points, there's 200 AU. So 200 times the distance from the sun to the earth is that point to that point. And you can see that, let's see, what is the distance? So that looks like 30 AU to Neptune. So if it's five times that, five times 30 is 150. So you have 150 AU roughly, so that's far. <laughs> yeah, or more. Um, yeah. Let's see. My calculations might be a little off here, but it's way out there. It, we're talking in the, you know, at least a few hundred AU astronomical units away. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and if any of you didn't follow that, I apologize. Uh, we are gonna move on here. Wow, so many questions. All right, good, 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 good. People are talking about black holes. Let's get to that really soon here. <laughs> this is a picture that we showed yesterday. Uh, you can see the Earth is down there. It's a really small dot. Jupiter. Hello from Earth. Yeah, hey, <laughs> I can see my house from here. Um, there's Jupiter, which we thought was pretty big, and it is, but there's the sun. Look how big the sun is compared to Jupiter. Next slide. <laughs> there's the sun. It's tiny compared to some other stars that we know about. Um, stars named Sirius and Pollux and Arcturus are huge compared to our sun. Okay, look at Arcturus here. See how big that is. I'm gonna to go to the next slide. There is Arcturus down there. <laughs> it's very small compared to stars called Pixel. Wait, Pixel? Pygol. Honestly, there's a little pop-up and it covered that. I can't see that word right now. Rigel, Aldebaran, Betelgeuse, and Antares are massive compared to Arcturus. I, I want to give a quick, um, quick challenge out there. I want people to be able to find Polaris. Yes. That is a great star to find. Um, you can 
look outside your window often you can see it um, Polaris is about four and a half times greater than our Sun and it's visible in the northern hemisphere um, and oh are you gonna pull up the chart on how to find it I'm gonna draw it awesome okay yeah I, I think you know if you don't get anything from this if you get nothing else be able to find a star um, you know I heard from someone is just like stars are so stable they're they're like a really super stable part of life that people that were on the sea they learned to navigate with them and as we navigate this new uh you know what, what all the stuff that the coronavirus is creating and everything you always have stars I, I think it's kind of it's kind of neat to be able to go look outside and just kind of go there's my star so this will help you get oriented so james yeah. how do they find polaris are you Yes, yeah, so this it? is a basic constellation. A constellation is a group of stars that to humans appear to form a picture in the sky. This isn't a perfect drawing, but this is the Big Dipper, uh, which is one of the easiest constellations to find in the sky, especially during the summer. Um, and it's like one, two, three, four, five. It's like seven or eight stars. I might have missed one in here, but the point is it looks like a dipper. It looks like a scoop. And um, if you follow these two stars here, and you follow this line straight, <laughs> it'll lead you right up. to a star. Yeah, you're a little out oh! of frame, but uh, you could probably put it right at the, yeah, there you go. There we go. Follow those, those two stars straight, follow that line, and it will lead you to a star called Polaris. Yeah, so I wanna challenge all the viewers out there, um, let us know if you find Polaris yeah. uh, in the next week or so. That is called the North Star. If you were to sit and stare at the night sky all night, every star in the sky would move. It would all move like this. One star doesn't move from how we see it, and that's Polaris. Everything moves around it, and that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very cool. Okay. Yeah. So let's, get, so let's get back to the slides with um with the stars and look how big those are that's incredible where's isn't, our sun there isn't our universe amazing there let me go back uh our sun is one Jeez. pixel in there and because i stole this from google images it actually doesn't even show up there <laughs> our sun is invisible compared to all these uh okay this video uh, let me fix something really quick. We'll do that. Okay, good. This video, there's, there's no sound to it. And it's going to be a little choppy from how you're going to see it, but that's okay. We're going to start with looking at someone's face and we're going to start zooming out. And by 10. Yeah. Let me pause it here for a moment. All right, down here at the bottom, you can see a scale right now it says 10 meters from that arrow to that arrow is 10 meters. Um, and I'll kind of read out to you the scale of what we're looking at as we keep zooming out. So there's the restaurant she's in. She's in the Google headquarters. And that's in Mountain View, California. And we mm -hmm. keep zooming out and there's the Bay Area in California. There's all the Western United States. There's North America. There's planet Earth, we're at 10,000 kilometers now. Finally, there's the moon, you know, 200,000 kilometers out. Now we're looking at millions of kilometers, tens of millions of kilometers. All right, finally, there's the rest of our inner solar system and the asteroid belt and Jupiter and Saturn and Neptune. And then there's the outer system, there's the Kuiper belt. New Horizons, hello. <laughs> there's something, there's some dwarf planets. There's something called the Oort cloud. It's just millions of comets floating around out there. We're now looking at the scale of one light year, Whoa. 10 light years. There's our closest stars, our closest neighbors, other stars around here. We're zooming out, we're zooming out. We're looking at 10,000 light years across now. There's our galaxy, there's the Milky Way galaxy. We're Hi, zooming Way. out now. There's other galaxies around us, look at them. Satellite galaxies. There's a, yeah, we're just zooming out. I, I can't even keep up with this. Look. Every point of light on there is a galaxy. Light years. Every One billion point light years. of light is a galaxy that we're looking at right now. 
and we're zooming in. All right, local well, galaxy yeah, group, Milky Way Galaxy. <laughs> Here's our region of the galaxy. There's stars around us. We're zooming back into our solar system. Woo! 10 million kilometers, <laughs> 1 billion kilometers. There's Earth. I was trying to keep up with it all. I can't. And, and we zoom back, back in. Mountain view. And there is Luis, <laughs> just kind of chilling. Oh man, that was a that was a journey. That was intense, man. Whew. You okay, Diego? Yeah. All I, right. I think I need my space helmet for that. <laughs> man, yeah. Okay. Ah, uh, I don't know about all of you. If if you're like out of breath after that after that journey. Whew. Okay, good. Space is big. Stuff in space is massive. It's so cool. How many stars are in our Milky Way galaxy, Diego? I don't know. I left the slide I'm, up, didn't I? Uh, <laughs> oh, right there. I meant oh, to ask him. <laughs> I meant to hide it from him and ask him. 100 to 300 billion stars. Wow, That's, how did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> this slide is very useful. Gosh, yeah, you know. Yeah. 100, 300 billion. And then as we saw when we zoomed out in that video, at, you know, just endless points of light. There's one to 200 billion galaxies in the universe. Of so, what we can perceive. Of what we can perceive. Of what light mm. has the possibility of coming in. So there's possibility. Yeah. Infinity is out there possibly. And that's a big, big mind boggling number. <laughs> that's right. So as you can see on the slide here, I put the very scientific uh, phrase for a, a very large number, like a lot. So that's like a lot of stars. <laughs> now, is our sun normal? Is our sun average? Or is our sun different and special or weird in some way? This is a great graphic. I love this. Um, you can see this line right here going across the middle is that is um, stars that are the same size, the same radius is the distance across is our sun or on that line lower than that the, the stars are smaller higher than that the stars are bigger and you can see most stars most most stars fall in this one kind of highway right here um now the the the, the, the bottom let's see the bottom scale the stars on the left of your screen the blue ones those are hotter like on the very left of this scale, it's 30,000 degrees. And on the right side, they're cooler. They're only like 2,000 or 2,500 degrees on the surface. And then the smaller ones are on the bottom, the larger ones are on top. So that's what we're looking at here. This main highway here, it's called main sequence. That's, the, that's what they started calling it. It's a main sequence star. It's on the you know, pretty much every star fits in there. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Okay. We are going to catch up. <laughs> yes, good. Good, 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 good. Red is cool. Blue is hot. April, you are absolutely correct. That is, that is what we are looking at here. Um, <clears throat> Rachel or River, one of you got Hi, guys. Uh, one of them asks, how is the sun so tiny? Well, it's not tiny to us, but compared to many other things in the universe, it is tiny because the universe is crazy. There's so much cool stuff happening that, uh, I mean, our sun is small compared to some things and it's absolutely massive compared to other things like us. Mm -hmm. um, so down here, you've got what are called white dwarfs and these are stars um, they're hotter than ours, but they're much, much smaller. And so we, we call them dwarfs because they're smaller than our own sun. We tend to compare things to us. Um, we were talking about some, some other stars out here earlier, like there's Betelgeuse and Aldebrand and some of these other stars that we saw in earlier slides that are way bigger than our own star. Um, we looked up what is the biggest star in the entire universe that we know of right now. What's that big guy over there? It's called UI Scooty. I think that's a great name. I just like saying that UI Scooty. 
It's like yeah. the stuns like scooting along in space. <laughs> you why scooty. <laughs> it's kind of like you're wide, Scooty. So if I, I just picture this this wide really planet, big, amazing, huge hulk of a star named Scooty, and I go, You wide, Scooty. <laughs> yep. And you why scooty is 1,700 times wider than our sun. Say that again. It is 1,700 times greater than our own sun. That's crazy. That's, That's amazing. Crazy. Our universe is an incredible place. All right. I'm going to leave that image up. I'm going to catch up with <laughs> a few questions. Um, Arjun asks, can you live on other planets that are not Earth? Thank you for that question. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Right now, no. P possibly in the future. Possibly. Yeah, it would take a lot of work. But yes, if we can get there, uh, we're pretty sure that there are other planets in the universe that are pretty Earth-like, that are warm enough for us to live on, that have liquid water, that either have an atmosphere similar to ours or that we can make similar to ours. I mean... Let's go back really quick. Uh, you know, there's hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy alone, and there's hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe. Let's assume that most stars have planets around them. Let's assume that most stars have several planets around them. That is billions and billions and billions and billions of planets. Just at some point, we're going to get lucky and find a planet that's similar to Earth. Uh, it's it's just it's just math. It's just the odds of it. Yeah, yeah. It I mean, can't not. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean it's pretty amazing odds that we have life on Earth apparently, but you know it's just it's a question that so many people at NASA are trying to answer, and it's just it, yep. it's really an underlying theme that drives people doing their work every day. Like they want to know, or is there other things out there? What, you know, like people are trying to figure out our place in the cosmos. It's, it's really amazing. It's really incredible. Hadia asks, are all stars hot? Yes. Uh, the thing that makes a star a star is that it is generating heat. It's generating light. It's generating this energy. And some stars are super bright, super, super bright. And some are not. Like this one that we're looking at right here, this is not a picture of an actual star. This is an artist that made a, a drawing of what we call a brown dwarf. We talked about white dwarfs back a couple slides ago. Down here, these are bright, they're hot, they're small, they're smaller than our own planet. Brown dwarfs, they're, uh, sorry, they're smaller than our own sun. Brown dwarfs are smaller than our own sun but they're not very bright, so we call them brown. Um, and Ron Beer asks, are gas giants a type of failed star? I wouldn't call it a failed star, but kind of, yeah. Anything that's small enough is a failed star because it didn't get big enough to start generating the light and heat that it does. Um, one, one thing I, I like to bring up with my students is things that we don't know. Because when I um, tell students about things that we don't know, it gets them interested. It makes them want to answer those questions. I was, uh, not too long ago, I was at NASA Goddard uh, by Washington, D.C., and I got to talk to a heliophysicist. And heliophysicist is somebody who studies the star, studies our sun. Um, and they, so they, they're really interested in, like, they can't solve this riddle with any kind of uh, a theory that makes sense. And so the, the, what they're trying to solve and they don't know is why is it that when you get closer to it, like the surface of the sun is cooler than the um, outside of the sun. Yeah. James, Go ahead. I got him going on a picture. Uh -oh, watch <laughs> out. <laughs> so yeah. So the question is why, um, you know, how do you explain this with the physics and with the math of why it's cooler on the inside than it is on the outside. And they don't have an answer for that. So, um, you know, if you're interested in this topic, this will teach you a lot about heliophysics as you try to um, answer that. There's a place called uh, 
the NOAA lab where they stare at the sun all day. This is in Boulder. Um, I mean, I got, not, <laughs> not, not directly at the sun with our own stare, eyes. Don't stare directly don't do at the sun. But you go into their lab and they have this giant room and they have these screens on the wall and they're just direct observations of the sun because the sun and how it flares is a big, uh, a big factor in our weather on earth. Um, and we're, there's still so many things that we're trying to understand and how that works. So many. Yeah, yeah there's yep. a lot of unknowns there. So if this is our sun, and this is the surface of our sun, the surface is about 3,500 degrees Celsius. Um, can you look that up real quick? Because I just sure, sure. pulled that number from memory. Okay. I want to make sure I'm giving correct yeah. things. I think I'm in the right area. Uh, sort of um, so let's pull that up in Celsius. Is, yeah, so that's uh, a second. Five thousand. I might be wrong here. That's about five. It's that would be five thousand four hundred. Good. I'm gonna go into Celsius. This. All Hopefully. right. So it's hotter than that. Let, let's call it about. Nope. Let's call it about five thousand. That's the right general area. The surface of the sun is ish 5,000 degrees. The area around the sun, the atmosphere around the sun, which is called the corona, is like a million degrees Celsius. We don't know why that is. Why is it so much hotter off of the surface of the sun than on the surface of the sun? You would think, you would think the surface would be the hottest, but it's not. They have missions out there right now trying to answer that question. Yeah, and whoever can answer this with a, a, a solid explanation that has the math to back it up, um, this would, you would win a Nobel, probably a Nobel Peace Prize. It's like in physics. Yeah, <laughs> yep. So good luck. Yeah, <laughs> <Good. laughs> now somebody yesterday was asking about solar waves and I promised we would talk about that. Think about Earth and how we have waves in the ocean and how we have earthquakes. The earth is moving all the time in big and little ways. Same thing is happening on the sun. And the sun is not just a stable ball of burning gas. There are explosions and big shifts all the time. I mean, if, you, you know, if it was the surface of a planet and you were standing on it, there would be vibrations and it'd be bouncing and moving and jumping and exploding and coming back together and like bits of it exploding off and then get pu getting pulled back into it. So there's these waves of stuff happening on the sun. And there's also stuff coming off of the sun. It creates weather, it creates space wind basically. And it's not wind like we feel on earth with, uh, with, with the air moving around us. It's wind in space created by these really high energy bits coming off of the sun. And you can, just like you can sail on the oceans of our planet by taking a boat out and putting up a sail and just letting the wind push you, there's stuff called solar sails where you're doing the exact same thing in space. It's like a ship in space. There's, they should probably have a word for that. <laughs> they should call it a spaceship. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Moving on. Moving yeah, on. Yeah, so that the the uh, the planetary society launched the solar sail. Oh yeah. So that mission's going on right yeah, now. Yeah, it's up there. They're, they have a they have a test of this up in space right now, and they just open up this huge sail. I mean, it's like massive, 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 bigger than our school, and it just kind of catches the light rays from the sun, it gets pushed along. They want to see how fast they can get it going. It's, it's really awesome. Yeah. Aubrey asks, are we going to talk about nebulas? I promised yesterday we would. We're definitely going to talk about nebulas. Whoo, catching up, catching up. So many things and we have about five minutes left. So what? we are going to plunge forward. I'll go back to screen share. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Brown dwarfs. Okay, so here's a small star. Uh, let's see, do I have another picture here? No, okay. This needs to go away. There we go. There's a small star over there. This is smaller than our own star. Uh, there's Jupiter, and that's about what 
a brown dwarf would be like size wise. Um, you could call Jupiter a failed brown dwarf or a, a an almost brown dwarf. If Jupiter got a bit bigger, a bit more massive, if it had eaten a few other planets as it was <laughs> as it was being formed, um, eventually it would become a brown dwarf. And what's going on is you've got. Oh, back to the whiteboard, y'all. <laughs> Interesting, the, the bands that you see on Jupiter versus the brown dwarf. Yeah, There's some it, it's, it's rotating, it's mm -hmm. spinning. You know, brown dwarf is halfway between a gas giant and a star, and it's got enough going on that it can be created. You know, I'm not going to do the whiteboard. It's got enough going on. It's mm -hmm. big enough that it's pressing, it's got enough gravity that it presses in on itself and it's creating heat and energy just because of the gravity <laughs> inside of it. But not so much that it is super bright like our star or like the small star that you see illustrated next to it here. Next week, we're gonna be talking, or next week, two weeks from now, we're gonna do a whole 45 minute webinar just on stars, different types of stars, and what is their life cycle like? How are they formed? What, how long do they last? And what happens when they die? Okay, okay. <laughs> we have to fast forward. Okay, when a star, when a big star gets towards the end of its life, it explodes. It does not go out quietly. It goes out with a bang and it goes kaboosh. And you get, Things that look like this. That, that's, that's a technical term. Kaboosh. <laughs> Kaboosh. <laughs> this is a nebula. This is a massive star that exploded. And while it's kind of sad to think about stars exploding, you think that they last forever. They don't. But what's happening here is this is going to give birth. This is going to give life to new solar systems, to new stars that can do new, better, more awesome things that that first star couldn't. <laughs> Here's another picture. Oh man, this thing is massive. It went kaboosh. They've added some color to this so that we can see it better. But now there's, there, there's, there's a lot of different types one. of light that we can't oh, see. Yeah. And that's a whole other space talk, but yeah, but there's a lot of light out there that we can't see. And um, these are all real pictures, guys. I mean, we've added some color to it to make it easier to see certain things. But uh, yeah, okay. We have to skip some stuff. Oh, I we have to skip some no. stuff because I I have quasars. to talk. Quasars. <laughs> yeah, Tell what a quasar is. This is a really cool star called a quasar. It is spinning so fast. You know how the Earth spins around once in twenty four hours. These stars spin around tens, hundreds, sometimes thousands of times per second. What? Per second. Per second. Brrr. If you could hear it, that's what it would sound like. <laughs> Science. Okay. Oh, man. It's just look, looking at some of these things. Th these are not real pictures here. These are artists drawing what they think quasars might look like. They're spinning so fast. They're shooting these jets of super energy off into the universe. And we can tell quasars from Earth because we, we get their radio signals. And their mm -hmm. radio signals are repetitive. Can we go to the slide with the with the that shows where Earth was? Oh, we got like two minutes left. We got two minutes yeah. left. We have to talk about a couple more things. Okay. I promise black holes. Black holes, they are so dense. There's so much gravity. There's so much in there. Nothing can escape. I not love even this light. Photo. Explain what this photo is about. So this photo, this or is this, a rendering artist. This thing. Rendering. Yeah. This is not a, a real photograph. This is an artist figuring out what a black hole would look like in space. Do you see that bit in the center where there's nothing? That's where everything is. That is a, so much gravity. If light enters it, light can't leave ever, period. That's why it's called a black hole. Um, and it, it, it's, it bends space and time. That's how crazy it is. So you can see it looks like it's bending the universe around it. It's bending the light. The light starts to, to approach it and the light gets kind of like if you're driving along in your car and you um and like the air the air doesn't go straight in your car the air has to move around your car 
And if you're driving through fog or smoke or something like that, you'll see the stuff in the air move around your car. The car pushes it out of the way. It's kind of what's going on with light black holes, yeah, around black, a black hole. Black holes bend space time. Yeah. And if that, here's another picture, a drawing of what a black hole might look like. Some of these bends in space time were discovered right, uh, right in the middle of Oregon and Washington at the Hanford site. Yeah. I all right. About that all day. This is not a fake thing. This is not an artist figuring out what it might look like. This is an actual picture of a black hole. It's a bit fuzzy, you say. <laughs> You're right. It's really far away. Uh, but what they can see, even though the, the black hole itself is black, as it pulls stuff into it, as it gobbles stuff up, it, um, it creates a lot of heat and energy. And we can see that heat. We can see that energy that creates light. So as it's pulling stuff in, it makes light and then the light gets sucked into the black hole. But some, anyway, mm. we are out of time. I wanna talk so much about this. Oh, look at all these things I have to skip. Okay, <laughs> I have to skip so much. <laughs> We're back next week. We're talking more about space. We're talking about space exploration. How did we learn a lot of this stuff? How did we get humans up into space? What's coming next? We're gonna talk about that next week. I have to end off here, but I'm gonna hang around for a few minutes after, after we stop broadcasting in the Q&A section and try to answer a few of those questions that I couldn't get to today. And um, go to heronbooks.com. You can use promo code Delphian30 to get here. I need to grab one thing. The math curriculum is fantastic. And I think that's one of the things that uh, throws students off the most while they're trying to pursue degrees in science, math. Um, they're just, they're, they have problems with math. So we got your math covered. Yes. <laughs> There's courses on heronbooks.com. One of the first ones is Earth One, Sun, Earth, Moon, and Stars. A lot of the basics of what we were talking about today are covered in here. And there's a lot more after this. So go to heronbooks.com. Some courses are free. The ones that aren't, you can use promo code Delphian30 to get 30% off. Thanks so much for joining us today and watching me stumble as I try to keep up with my own thoughts as I talk about space. <laughs> All right. You guys have a great day.